Here's today's project. It's a little brooch that lights up and it's got a lot of key elements that um, I really feel are classically steampunk. So here's one a little closer. Uh, it's just basically a little block of wood to form a base. It's got two vacuum tubes, one on each top, and then just a bunch of little doodads and stuff in the front to make it look interesting. This acorn nut here is actually what operates. So you press that in and it lights up a chip in the back that's hidden in here that is using red, green, and then there's a blue I don't use to actually light these up. And this will run for about 20 seconds and then turn itself off. The whole thing is based on a toy sticker like this. This is a vinyl sticker I've seen them branded for Marvel superheroes, for Disney uh, princesses. They have a lot of different things. I was picking this one up at the dollar store and it's simply a flat vinyl sticker that when you press it, it lights up like that. And if you take that apart and cut it out, this is the chip. I love toys like this. Every time I go into Dollar Tree or Target's Dollar Spot or any place where they have cheap little light up toys, I'm all over them. Uh, I'll look at them, try to figure out exactly what kind of chip is running it. Uh, is it one little consolidated piece like this or is it something spread all through a bunch of plastic that I might not be able to remove cleanly? This removes beautifully. It's a little white button in the middle of it is what operates it. You press that and oh baby, that thing is bright. It's even brighter when I point the LED directly at you. So LEDs are a little bit directional and we're gonna use that a little later on to see how much brighter we can make these. Uh, on the front, it's got a little bit of circuitry. On the back, it has the batteries. Uh, sometimes it's two lithium ion. In this case, it's three. Uh, alkaline button cells. Uh, this will run, wow, 20 or 30 hours of heavy use before you have to replace those batteries. So it's pretty, it's a, it's a nice good deal. And again, it's only a buck for the actual chip. The little brooch that I built is absolutely designed around this chip. When I say that the project is designed around the chip, here's the chip, here's the box that holds it. And this hole is just the right size to hold the chip. And you can see there isn't a lot of anything else other than that. There are also the two holes coming down from the top. Those we need to line up with the brightest lights on the chip. And I know the brightest lights are the red and the green. So I take this with the button pointing forward and I work it up into the, into those two holes, there we go so that when it is on and we trigger it, trigger it, you'll be able to see the red and the blue lights coming out through the holes in the top, the, the or red and the green. The blue one is just kind of wasted. Uh, I have actually done a version of these where you've got a little bubble on the bottom, but it's, the blue generally isn't as bright and isn't, isn't quite as dramatic. Uh, you can actually rotate this and bring different ones up for different colors, so you could color theme it a little bit as you go along. Uh, talked about where that came from. As I go through and I build this project, I'm sometimes going to show you a single piece that I'm working on, and sometimes I'm going to show you that I'm making a whole bunch of them. It's because I'm prepping for a class. Uh, if you're in San Diego or you're visiting San Diego or you're coming here for a convention, frequently I'll be asked to teach classes at those. So uh, coming up May 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th, is Costume Con 36. So this is actually for May of 2018. Because hopefully this will be on the internet for a while. Uh, and they've asked me to teach a couple of classes. So one is this little brooch. Uh, the other is making medals. And I'll hopefully have some video up on that shortly. If not, remember all my projects are always on the blog, theirontailor.blogspot.com. So you can get written instructions and pretty pictures. So as I build this, uh, you'll get to see the pieces and the parts going together. Again, you can individualize the front any way you want. If you've got neat things, this one has a little tiny um, wind-up watch that I've just exposed the works. Uh, this is actually a reproduction uh, dog license tag. And then I've got little coils that I've made, could be running electrical, could be doing something else. 
So any kind of little pieces can go on there. The vacuum tubes go right on the top so they line up. And then the back is a pair of Titac backs so that it can obviously be worn, just like I'm wearing this one. Uh, and then the piece in the center with this little bar, that's holding the chip in place. Uh, and we keep it with screws so that you can get in there and replace the batteries if you need to. So I'm going to pull together my pieces and parts and let's get rolling with this project. One of the other little bit harder to get things you'll need for this project besides that lighting chip are vacuum tubes. Uh, now if you have an industrial supply um, or an industrial liquidators uh, store somewhere in your area, chances are they have got buckets of these. And if you tell them, hey, I don't need them to work, I'm using them for an art project, there's a good chance they'll go, oh, there's a bucket there in the corner and you'll get them for 50 cents, a dollar each. If they're working, you might have to pay two or three dollars for them, uh, for the small ones like this. But uh, again, this is where you go in your wheel and deal. You talk to the folks to see what you can come up with. If you do want to get on the internet and buy these, uh, onesie twosies are going to cost you one, two, three dollars. Uh, if you buy them from, there's a group out of uh, New England, Viva Tubes on eBay, that puts out huge lots, 150 to 500 at a time. So if you just want to make one, maybe not an option. If you like this and you decide, hey, a bunch of my friends would like this, you could all kick in. You can get these then for about, um, you can get the cost down to maybe about 20 cents each. Again, some of them are going to be broken, some are going to be the wrong size, but hey, I'm doing other projects with the big ones. So this is how I'm using up the smaller tubes with the smallest base. These little um, wire feet should go into a socket. I'm going to cheat a little and squeeze them into a 3 8 inch hole with a little bit of super glue around the edge. It actually holds it very securely. The other nice thing about these smaller ones is they're glass throughout. The bigger ones have a black plastic base. You cannot shine light up into them because the best part about this is to get that light going up into the vacuum tube and, you know, kind of showing what's going on. Now, the problem with most vacuum tubes is there are always plates running across them that run at different voltages, and that's what accelerates the electrons, and that's where all the magic happens. It means you can't get the light past that plate. So as you can see, the bottom of mine are lighting up, but not really the top. But still, it gives a really nice effect. It, 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 I feel vacuum tubes are so incredibly steampunk you wouldn't believe it. A lot of people will tell you, no, you can't have anything with electricity. If you go back and study the history, late 1800s, Tesla was inventing everything. He worked for Edison, who promptly stole a bunch of his patents and ideas. He left and went working on his own. Uh, he had uh, George Westinghouse uh, bankrolling him, and Westinghouse really stole a lot of his patents too, but at least kept him in enough money he could keep working on projects. Uh, fascinating guy. There's a lot of interesting tales like the great World's Fair Chicago uh, in the 1890s. That was the first time you had seen a lot of electrical lights. And uh, Edison was ticked that they had decided to go with Tesla's alternating current instead of Edison's direct current. And the wars on that, you can do a master's project on, they're terrific. They did incredibly strange and arcane things to fight back and forth over what should be selected. But Edison said, fine, if you're going to go with alternating current, you cannot have any of my light bulbs and refuse to sell them any. Tesla had less than a year when they made that decision to invent the fluorescent light bulb and manufacture enough to light the entire fair. And if you've seen uh, a lot of the um, more recreations in movies, Meet Me in St. Louis, things like that, you'll see that when they light up something, it's just dramatic and breathtaking and everyone's amazed. So, uh, so long rambling story, but yeah, it's why I believe vacuum tubes are absolutely quintessential to steampunk because you've got people inventing uh, just on the cusp. They literally had no idea what the physics were behind any of this stuff. They were just putting things together and see how they work. And that's kind of the heart and soul of steampunk. So it's why I love this project. I love the vacuum tubes. Sometimes you can find people who will give these to you out of the goodness of their heart. 
Um, had a guy I worked with, was in a little rock and roll band, and they used a tube damp. And they'd give me these humongous ones every couple of months. They'd have to change them all out, and they'd hand them over to me. Ha <laughs> ha! Happy camper. So, see if you can find some of these. They're always the toughest part. Uh, I know at all of our steampunk conventions, somebody is always selling old tubes for a buck or two each. So it's a great place to stock up and start working on projects. What I'm working with today is the little body for the vacuum tube brooch. And this is just a little piece of one by two. It's got a big flat hole drilled in the back. It has two holes drilled in the top that have to match up and have to actually open up into the uh, big hole. And then in the very center, we have a small hole that goes all the way through. Uh, I'm going to be making a whole batch of these for a class. So uh, I found the best way to do this is to lay out a whole bunch of them on a single uh, piece of wood. Set up my drill press over here. There we go. And drill them all at once. So I can drill. I'm going to do at least 15 here today. And then shift it over and drill the top ones and then cut them apart because that seems to work the best. So I'm gonna set things up here and uh, then I'll show you what I'm doing and we'll do a little drilling. Okay, to drill the big hole, I'm gonna use this Forstner bit. And what it does is it makes a very wide uh, hole. This is an inch and a quarter and they go up past two inches, but it's a very flat one. So I can go very close to the face of the wooden block without actually going through. It'll also leave a little mark that'll help me drill that center hole as we go through. The ones coming in from the top, this is only a 3 8 inch hole. I could use a regular 3 8 inch bit, but I find I get a little better use out of, this is a tiny version of the Forsner bit again. And because the little horns on the edge cut the edge cleaner, it doesn't tend to twist and split as much. And finally, to make that little hole in the center, I have a standard tw twist drill bit. Uh, this is just a tiny bit bigger than 1 8 because that's the size of the bolt I'm using. So it's a 9 64 inch drill. So I'm going to put these into the uh, drill press, set up some distance and some fences, and I'll show you what that looks like. So what I've done is, this is the piece I'm going to cut out with my layout line, center line for the big hole, ends of the block, and then the um, holes for the ones coming down the top. And I've set a scrap piece to act as a back fence. So now when I push this against it, this Forsner bit will be located exactly where I want it, front to back, because you don't have much extra in here. The size of the hole is determined by the size of the chip I'm using. And I could go a little bigger, I can't go any smaller. I really can't go any bigger on this size lumber. So it has to be pretty accurate. By laying out the fence, I can just rip through all these now very quickly. I've also adjusted this so that the bit only goes down that far, not quite all the way through the wood, and that should give me exactly the depth I need. So now all I have to do is turn everything on, put, one, put this in, and drill hole after hole after hole very quickly, and I'll knock all these out in a couple of minutes. Okay, I've changed my setup a little bit. I moved the uh, fence in the back and I changed the height. So now this will go about halfway into the block, which is the way I want it. And these are the holes from the top. So they need to come down and be a little bit wider than the hole itself because the lights stick into those spots. Um, it'll become more apparent as I put it together. So once again, I'm just going to line up the bit with kind of the edge of the hole here. I have the layout marks on the top, but I'm going to fine tune it a little as I go along.
Now we're ready to do the final hole, and that's the one through the center that comes out the front. So that the front doesn't tear out, I'm putting an extra little piece of wood underneath it uh, to support the wood. I have no fences. This time I'm strictly going to line up with a little depression the Forsner bit, bit, bit left me, and I'll just drill straight through uh, until I'm into the second piece of wood. Well, it's time to cut these apart. As you can see by my layout lines, I'm really off, but that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and eyeball them to center up between these, um, these holes and then kind of equal them out on the other side. So I'm going to do it mostly by eye. I could do this with a handsaw. If I was doing one or two, I'd probably do it that way because I'm doing so many. I'm going to go with a miter box saw. So I'm just using it as a simple chop saw. I've got it set 90 degrees vertical, zero degrees on my angle, and I'm just going to go through here and chop, chop, chop. loud, isn't it? So here is my finished piece, pretty close to equal spacing on both sides. Got my holes in the top, hole coming through the front. I'll just round these edges off now and do a little sanding and it'll be ready for staining. Every so often you have to stop in your project and test fit things. When I put the screw through on this, I found that the original bit, which was a 964th, was too small. I had to go up to an 1164th re-drill it. I also noticed as I looked, there's a little bit of a recess, and that allows the head of this screw to actually go down into the wood. That's so it can completely retract so the uh, switch on the light chip can fully disengage and it's not just stuck on all the time. In order to do that, I've set a uh, 5 16 bit into my drill press, and I've made it so that I just barely, I don't actually touch it, I've just got a little bit of a gap between it. It's probably less than a 16th of an inch, maybe even a 32nd. But what that does is it gives me that little landing so that the head can go down there and it isn't in all the time. Now I've apparently drilled these a little deeper than I did my original, so they won't, this recess won't be as deep. That's no problem. I just put a slightly thicker layer of uh, the fun tack in this, and we'll see that when we assemble it, and that will account for the height difference. So I should be okay on it. So I'm going to crank this up and uh, re-drill all these again. So even taking the time to set up the video camera and do the videoing, I'm about 20 minutes into this and I've made 15 of the little blocks, um, possibly a few more. So everything is cut, everything is drilled. Just now it's uh, rounding the corners a little bit, hitting it with power sander, and that should leave me ready for my stain. Well, I'm done with my sanding. Uh, just because I don't always show you the safety gear doesn't mean it isn't there and doesn't mean I don't use it. A lot of this equipment is real loud. I like working with traditional tools, chisels, planes a lot of times just because they're quiet. Uh, but I got to admit, working with a power sander is a lot easier way to finish a lot of these off. So since we're talking about finishes, let's show you what we got. Uh, here are some of the blocks. So I've hit them once with 100 grit sandpaper. And finish is purely a matter of what you like. Um, I've long ago reconciled the fact that the stuff I build are prototypes. They are not the polished finished thing that are gonna end up in the great Victorian parlors all over uh, the British Empire. 
I like to see some tool marks in it. I like to see the saw marks on the edge of it a little bit. So I've sanded some of them off. You'll still see them. When we put the stain on, it will help fill a little of that. It can also bring out some imperfections, which is kind of a neat look. Uh, I also believe if you're working with wood, it should look like wood. I, I'll never paint these. I'll stain them. So you'll still see knot holes and grain and things like that in it. If you look at the classic Victorian, uh, furniture, everything like that. It's beautiful wood. Now, I'm working in really cheap pine, so I'm going to cheat and use um, something that Minwax puts out called Poly Shades. Here it is, tasteful product plug. Uh, you can get this in very small little containers. I go through a lot of this. I buy it in quarts. I should probably think about buying it in gallons. It's polyurethane with a stain, and this one is antique walnut. It's my favorite. I also use satin instead of gloss, uh, just because I like the look of it. Uh, I can put three layers on and get to a gloss, but typically I'll just put one layer on. It isn't shiny at all, but it is very dark. You can see there's the original color and there's what I got to. So you can go with lighter colors, you can do whatever you want. I like this color, this is kind of my signature. Everything I do gets a coat of this, it seals it. Uh, it means if you're out in rain, it isn't gonna suck up too much of it. You can spill things on it, it's not a crisis. So I'll put one coat of this on all this. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to leave these a little rough. Uh, they're not all exactly the same. They shouldn't be. These would be turned out by hand. They should be a little different. But if you want to go through and use eight different grits of sandpaper and sand this thing until it's velvety smooth and an erotic experience to fondle it, by all means, go for it. This is entirely what you want to do with your project. So I'm going to go through pretty quick. Do a little paint, be, or do a little stain, and be done. Uh, if you want to go and put a lot more time and effort into it, that's entirely up to you. And that's something that you need to decide as a maker. What is your signature style? Or maybe you have multiple styles. Maybe you do a prototype, but then you turn around and you do a very nice finished one for somebody. Uh, and if I do something as a gift, I will generally spend a little more time on it than if I do it for myself. Uh, when I do these kits, I'm kind of in the middle. Uh, I'm not doing... Uh, a really fabulous job finishing. I'm certainly doing a nice one, but again, it gets that idea in my mind out that this is a prototype. It's something that, oh, we just got it from the research labs. You're going to field test it. Hey, once the person lived. Uh, those are the kind of things we're looking for in a time agent. Somebody willing to grab that and go, yes, I want to try it. Uh, so, got these cut, ready to stain. Uh, once I'm stained, I'll actually assemble one, but I'm going to keep the rest parceled out in kits so that uh, my class can go ahead and assemble them the way they want. So here we are with all blocks um, stained up. You can see I've got one down here that I'll have natural just to show you the difference. Uh, that's it, one coat. They're still a little shiny now, but once this dries overnight, they'll be a little duller and they'll be the perfect base for our little brooches. Well, I've done all the prep work, and so here's everything I need to put together one of the vacuum tube brooches. I've got the little block, my vacuum tubes, uh, tie tacks, a little nut for the um, on-off switch, the chip itself, which of course is important and it works, some stuff to fancy up the front, and then the pieces to hold the chip in place in the back. I also have a little bit of super glue, uh, a small screwdriver with these little tiny screws, Snipe nose pliers are always nice, and then this little thumbtack is actually going to take the place of an awl to punch some holes for me. Also have, very importantly, a nice little plastic plate so I don't end up gluing anything to the table. So that's always good. So I'm going to take my block, and I'm going to take a little nut, the nut and the bolt. bolt goes through from the inside, so the acorn nut... One little piece on the outside. And to make sure that, that acorn nut doesn't fall off, I'm going to use just a tiny, tiny, tiny dab of super glue on the threads. So I use a small enough amount, I can put a screwdriver in there and a wrench and pop that off if I ever need to fix it in the future. I rolled out my uh, sticky putty, 
So I'm a little longer than the block. I'm going to make a little circle of it. And I'm going to put it right on the chip surrounding the little button that's the trigger. Now remember, green and the red are my brightest ones. Those need to go out into these holes that are going to pop up the top. So there's a little finagling to do this. But if you can kind of get one into the hole, and then I'm just going to use a little screwdriver to work the other one down there. So now the chip is in position, looks nice coming out the top. Now it's still loose, and the way we'll solve that is I'm going to use these three little foam discs as spacers. I may not need them all, in this case it looks like I do. And this little strap is going to go right across the outside to hold it in place. I'm going to use these really tiny little screws to hold it there. Okay, to put these little tiny screws in place, they're really hard for me to handle with my big fingers. So I'm actually going to put one through the hole in the end of the strap, screwdriver into it. I've got the little tiny screw in my metal strap. Get it in position. There we go. Okay, I've got one in, still loose enough that I can swing that. Make sure my chip's positioned in the middle again. Drop in my little pieces of foam. One lines up with the hole. All right, so my chip's secured in place. If the light's on at this point, you're pushing down too hard, so just remove one of those uh, foam deals. But push in the front, lights it up. That's exactly what I want. I'm going to put the vacuum tubes and the TyTac backs on now, because then I want to let this sit for about three minutes to make sure all the glue is dried and hard. So my handling, I'm probably best off doing the TyTac backs first. Remember when you're using super glue, less is more. I use the gel type because it works best with the porous surface of the wood and then the non-porous surface of the TyTac backs. In the classes, I'll generally have everyone press and hold these for about 40 seconds. That's what I find it takes to get them to really hold in place. I'm going to be a little careful and hope they stay there. Now for this part, the uh, it's probably best to put the glue around the edges of the wood hole. Before I do that, I'm going to look at the wires, and they're all pretty straight right now. If I try to put that into the hole, I'm going to be fighting a little bit. So I'm going to come in with my thumbnail and just bend them ever so slightly in. It'll just help guide it a little bit, and uh, they'll still be the same distance on the outside, so it'll give me a tight fit when I get it all the way in there. 
This is one of those tips that I learned the hard way after doing quite a few of these. Now I'm ready to glue. So I'm just going to lay a little bead right along this edge. Pick a side. You can decide whether you want the little label showing or not. I'm going to say not. Looks like it's nice and straight, just the way I want it. You can always go back in later, put a little more of the glue down if you need it. Trying to look at this from kind of every angle so that they will hopefully be reasonably parallel. Okay. So those are those four pieces on. I'm going to set this aside now and give it two or three minutes just to let it set up. Okay, so my glue's dried and now I just need to dress up the front. So this is a little asymmetric. It's a little wider on one side than the other, so I'm going to match my pieces that way. It's be kind of a nice look. Um, this one I'm going to go ahead and use that last screw to put into place with just a little bit of glue behind it. So I'll position it about where I want. A couple of tiny dabs on the back. I'll let that glue set up and then I'll play with the screw again. And we'll let that sit for a minute or two. I'll use my push pin to make a couple of holes on each side. And then I can place tiniest little bit of glue there. Now I can put the legs of one of these springs in on each side. And these are just coiled pieces of wire that I made on my little coiling machine. And that gives the illusion of wire circuit path, heat exchanger, who knows. Uh, fun thing is that you can just take pieces and put them on here kind of at random, just getting the design you like. 
So here's my finished piece. I went ahead and put another little coil on the bottom using the same technique of punching a hole and putting a little glue in. I snuck back and put that little tiny screw in um, on my number tag. And I press the button and it lights up again. A little hard to see as bright as this room is. Uh, these really look spectacular in even an evening uh, kind of lighting situation. Again, you could dress this up any way you want. You could certainly go bigger with the body, play with it uh, in any way, shape, or form. I've done some where I drill the holes in from the side and I mount the um, vacuum tubes on the side, and that's on the blog as well. So uh, all sorts of wonderful opportunities. Great little piece, and I hope you have fun making it.